It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of His Majesty's loyal opposition. Good morning. Good morning, Speaker. Um, yesterday, the government finally released its business case for relocating the Ontario Science Centre to Ontario Place, Speaker. It showed how uh, finally after they tried to hide it for so long. It showed that the cost of Order. building a new science centre at Ontario Place would be double the cost of repairing the existing science centre. All the so-called savings come from the lower cost of operating a half-sized science centre over 50 years. So my question is for the Premier. Why would this Premier force the people of Ontario to pay twice as much for a science centre that's half the size? And to reply, Minister of Infrastructure. And thank you to the member for the question. Funny that she's speaking about the business case, but yesterday she was calling it a shell game and a scam. There is no scam here, Mr. Speaker. We made the business case public, and the numbers are very clear that we would be saving $257 million over a 50-year period and up to $600 million in tomorrow's dollars over a 50-year period. Now, I know what the Leader of the Opposition is doing. She doesn't want, she doesn't want children to have a science centre for the next 50 years. That is what she is saying, because she's not thinking about the long-term sustainability of that facility. Mr. Speaker, the evidence was clear yesterday. I was super happy to share it with the public, and I'm sorry, but they have nothing to say. This supplementary question. Yeah, yeah, speaker, scam, shell game, but just don't you know, count on me here. The Globe and Mail, all spin, bogus logic, faulty numbers. <laughs> I mean, let's talk about kids. Let's talk about children. Schools from across the province visit the Science Centre. Kids and families learn about science and the world around us. The government is slicing it in half and reducing its capacity, planning to fire Science Centre staff. That's how they're going to find savings. And making it harder for kids to actually go there. So back to the Premier. At a time when we need people to go into the sciences, why is this government making it even harder? Minister of Infrastructure. I would love to talk about the attendance of the Science Centre. In fact, attendance at the Science Centre has been declining by 40 per cent since 2009. Why is that the case? I don't know. It could be the fact that this facility is uh, 54 years old. But let's talk about the size of the new of the Science Centre. Less 18 per cent of the size of the Science Centre is actually used for exhibits today. The new Order. facility, although smaller in size, more energy efficient, would actually be more sustainable and will have more 10,000 more uh, square feet of exhibition space for the children to enjoy. I'm going, I'm going to ask the member for Hamilton Mountain, the government house leader, to come to order. The final supplementary. I'll tell you, you know, the legacy of disrepair is on this government and the previous government. But I'll, I'll give them some advice for free here. They can save $650 million right now by cancelling the public subsidy for their luxury spa. How about that? The Ontario Science Centre is a crucial cultural and educational hub, as well as an employer for people in East York, including in the Thorncliffe Park and Flemington Park neighbourhoods. Instead of making the necessary repairs, the Premier wants to spend twice as much to build a new science centre that's half the size, located an hour further away for anybody who doesn't already live in downtown Toronto. So to the Premier, why won't the Premier listen to the people of Thorncliffe Park, of Flemington Park and many other communities saved, uh, served by the science centre and keep it where it is? Minister of Infrastructure. Hello, Mr. Speaker, there's the leader opposition talking about Therme again. She is obsessed. That is all she cares about. She doesn't care about revitalizing Ontario Place and bringing it back to life, uh, making sure that we improve the site. But, Mr. Speaker, let's talk about what she would like to do. Okay, fine. So let's provide millions more dollars to the existing Science Centre facility. Let's do that this year. You know what? Let's do that next year. 
and then let's do that the year after, and then let's face a systematic failure, structural failure, and then be forced to decommission the building. Now, I don't think that is the responsible move. I don't think that's the responsible move for the hardworking people at the Science Centre. What we're doing, Mr. Speaker, is ensuring that Ontarians have a Science Centre for the future, for the next 50 years, and we are being fiscally prudent. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next question, once again, the Leader of the Opposition. Sure. Yesterday, I asked, I asked the Premier uh, why this $650 billion luxury spa is so important to him at a time when Ontarians can't make ends meet. He couldn't answer me. So I'm going to ask again, and hopefully he'll answer me this time, to the Premier, why is this luxury spa so important to him that he is rewriting the laws of the province of Ontario to make it happen? Minister of Infrastructure. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and uh, thank you to the member opposite for the question. Let's again raise the fact that Thermae was a successful proponent when we weren't even in government back in 2016, and they were again a su successful proponent back in 2019. But I would like to ask the member opposite, why is she so against fixing Ontario Place? Why does she want Ontario Place to continue to deteriorate? to continue to flood, to continue to flood to the degree where Live Nation actually had to cancel their concerts in 2017. How is that acceptable? How is that acceptable? Can you answer that question for the people of Ontario? Because I would like to hear it. A supplementary question. Quite a performance speaker. Uh, this bill, uh, this bill, the, the so-called Order. This bill, the so-called Rebuilding Ontario Place Act, specifically blocks people from suing the government for misrepresentation or misconduct. It specifically blocks remedies for people who have been harmed by government misfeasance, bad faith, breach of trust, or breach of fiduciary obligation. It is un. Precedented. So, Speaker, to the Premier, what does it tell Ontarians about this government's secret 95 year long deal that they have to rewrite the laws to protect themselves? Minister of Infrastructure. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, let's talk about why people enter into a long-term lease. We entered into a long-term lease with the City of Toronto when we built the Science Centre facility 54 years ago. Why did we do that? Because we paid for the facility and we wanted to know that we could stay there for a while. The same circumstances exist at Ontario Place. We have someone that is willing to invest in the site in terms of hundreds of millions of dollars operate a facility that families can enjoy, a wellness and water park facility, and contribute, contribute to the annual maintenance of the site so that we can have a well-maintained Ontario place. Mr. Speaker, again, I ask the member across the floor, why is she so against bringing Ontario Place back to life and saving the Science Centre? The final supplementary. Gotcha. Gotcha. So instead of learning the lessons of the Greenbelt scandal, this time they're covering their tracks so they don't get caught the next time. Okay, we got it. Here's another thing that Bill 154 does. It would give another minister, the Minister of Infrastructure, the power to issue MZOs. I asked the Premier yesterday why he would do this, and he answered, why wouldn't we? Well, I'll tell you why they shouldn't. They're under uh, criminal investigation already by the RCMP and the Auditor General for abusing MZOs to benefit their insider friends. Already. So to the Premier, is this government expanding MZO powers to make it easier to grease the wheels for more of their insiders?
Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. You know, our, you know who our insiders are, Mr. Speaker? Olivia Chow, the most powerful NDP leader in the province of Ontario. That's who our insiders are. Right? That's who our insiders are. This is a caucus that is going Order. to vote against somebody who sat in their caucus, an NDP Order. leader, mayor of the city of Toronto. You know what this deal does? The deal ensures that there is housing in the city of Toronto. The deal supported Order. by the mayor of Toronto brings back Ontario Place, yes. It saves the Science Centre, yes, Mr. Speaker, but it also provides transit and transportation for the City of Toronto, Mr. Order. Speaker. And that is why the City of Toronto, led by Mayor Olivia Chow, are supporting this deal, Mr. Speaker. She was in this place not two days ago touting the importance of this deal. The only one who is against this deal is the NDP leader of Order. the opposition. And why is she against Spons. it? Because they are against everything. There is nothing that they want. This is a radical NDP, a weakened NDP leader. She should take the advice of the mayor of the city of Toronto, support this deal for the people of Toronto. Stop the clock. Order. Order. Start the clock. The next question, the member for Muskegawak, James Bay. Thank you, Speaker. To the Prime Premier. In the north, there's already been two closures for the Highway 11 because of snowfall. The, the government has an agreement to, to put in there hands of the province, the responsibility for the Gardiner Expressway and the DVP. Have you signed the same agreements with the municipalities in the north as you have in the south? Speaker, what a question to get from the member opposite, right? I tell you what, why don't you stand in your place and vote in favour of the bill that your leader just said was a scam? How can you in one breath say we want you to do more of what you're just doing in Toronto, but in the other breath lead question period with we don't like the deal, we're not voting against, we're voting against it. The member for St. Paul's in her member statement said she would be voting against the very same bill that the mayor of the city of Toronto is in favour of, the Order. NDP mayor of the city of Toronto is in favour of, and now this member stands in his place and says, can you do more of it? Well, I'll tell you what. We're going to do more to build Ontario despite the objections of the NDP. First to make the comments to the chair. The supplementary question, the member for Temiskaming Cochrane. Thank you, Speaker. We must be talking about a different bill because that bill just says discussions about the highways. And while you're discussing the Gardner and the Don Valley, how about discussing Highway 11, which you already have control of, which people play chicken with transports every day, transports passing each other on double lines, people being pushed in the ditch, and the Trans Canada Highway. How about discussing with municipalities like Timmins, like Timiskaming Shores, like Iroquois Falls about the highways that you downloaded to them, and how about discussing to upload to them so they can pay for social services, so they can pay for, for subsidized housing? How about doing that? Thank you. Members will please take their seats. Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. I almost feel like I should have the sweater vest on again. <laughs> I, feel, I feel that today would have been a good sweater vest day. To hear the NDP stand in their place now and ask us to continue doing the job that we've been doing for five years, and they have voted against it every single time. We're bringing back roads. We're building roads. We're making them safer. That member votes against it. His own caucus has just said they're going to vote against a bill, a bill that we are bringing forward to improve transit and transportation in the city of Toronto to create thousands of jobs for the people of Toronto. I tell you what we will do. We will continue to reach out to our municipal partners. We'll continue to make those investments to improve roads, not only in southern Ontario, but in northern Ontario, bring back the Northlander, expand Highway 401, make our roads safer, improve bridges, bring jobs, hope and opportunity back to what you called a wasteland with the support of the Liberals. Again. 
ask the members to make their comments through the chair. The next question, the member for Brantford Brant. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Northern Development and Minister of Indigenous Affairs. Muni municipalities across Ontario, especially in rural, remote and northern communities, face unprecedented economic challenges due to unforeseen additional costs arising Speaker, from the carbon tax. Increasing costs to heat buildings and rising fuel costs for frontline municipal vehicles create economic and budgetary challenges for our municipal partners. This is especially true for northern municipalities and Indigenous communities who feel the effects of the federal carbon tax more significantly than other municipalities. And while the NDP tries to confuse everyone as to where they stand on this punitive and regressive tax, our government's position has always been clear. It's time to scrap the carbon tax. Speaker, can the minister please explain how the carbon tax negatively impacts northern municipalities and Indigenous communities. Thank you. The Minister of Northern Development and Minister of Indigenous Affairs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The, the federal government made the pitch to the municipalities that this carbon tax would have a net benefit for them. And, uh, uh, and opposition uh, members here in this place have rallied around that thought. But let's test that theory for a second. In fact, Mr. Speaker, 10% of tax revenues are used to fund environmental projects for small businesses, municipalities, hospitals, schools, and Indigenous communities. Wow. Meanwhile, many municipalities have seen significant increases in their operating expenses because of the carbon tax. In Kenora Rainy River, the local district service board tells us that their fuel costs have doubled since 2020. Mr. Speaker, even in the NDP-governed British Columbia, we're seeing strong opposition by the municipalities to this regressive tax. Fort St. John said it best. They said carbon tax on home heating and everything else is an unfair financial burden Bonds. for residents in northern cities in their province. We agree, Mr. Speaker. Let's scrap that tax. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you, Minister, for that response. It's, and it's clear from your response that the negative impact from the carbon tax continues to be a pressing concern for northern municipalities and Indigenous communities. Major industries and local businesses across the north are worse off as a result of the carbon tax. Every day, municipalities and businesses deal with pressures of making difficult decisions because of this lud ludicrous and punitive tax. It is difficult to understand why the independent Liberals and the opposition NDP continue to disrespect the North by supporting the federal government's imposition of this regressive tax. Speaker, can the minister please elaborate on how the carbon tax is making life more expensive and more costly for Northern Ontario? Thank you. Minister of Northern Development. Mr. Speaker, we can't have a contemporary conversation about northern development without thinking about the cost that the carbon tax puts on all of the different projects that we do and the industries that drive our communities. The Canadian Energy Centre reports that the forestry and logging sector in Ontario alone will see a cost increase of 5%. Now, a lot of those trees create board foot. That board foot goes to build homes which we badly need. So we can see those costs being buried in the very things that we're trying to build for Ontario in the midst of a housing crisis. The same study suggests that the carbon tax will result in a 4.4 increase in the cost of creating legacy infrastructure for mining operations and those mining operations, Mr. Speaker. That's not helpful when we're trying to develop Spons. critical minerals, Mr. Speaker, to transform a green economy and incredible economic op opportunity for Ontario. Let's just scrap the tax. The next question. The next question, the member for St. Catharines. Thank you. Yes, uh, Just hit it. Hit it on. Hit it on the. Go ahead, Teresa. Contraception. Contraception. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Speaker. I. Uh Thank you, Speaker. I was just wondering, uh, we uh, was in great debate yesterday and the questions to the Minister of Health. We had a great debate and, uh, on universal contraception and uh, we had found out that OHIP Plus covers, OHIP Plus and, uh, and um, the government's uh, coverage 
that they mentioned. It, they said that it was six million people, but most of them are men, seniors, and children. And I'm wondering if the uh, uh, the speaker, the minister, can answer that question. Why doesn't it cover the 30 years in between? To apply, the deputy premier and minister of health. Well, per perhaps the member opposite is not familiar with the Trillium Drug Plan, which is available to all Ontario residents who have a financial need to ensure that they have their drugs covered. Of course, we've often talked about the OHIP Plus pathway for individuals under the age of 25 and the Trillium Drug Plan. Thank you, Speaker. A supplementary question, the member from Nickelback. Speaker, we all know that when we make access easier, we get resolved. We get resolved by lowering the demand in the rest of our healthcare system. There is an inequity right now for women who cannot gain access to contraception. We have an opportunity in a few minutes as legislator to change all of that, to make sure that every woman in Ontario who needs contraceptions will be covered and will be getting contraception through our health care system. Why is it that after discussion, after reading hundreds of letters of women who needs this to happen, we are still debating this issue? This is a non-issue, Speaker. This is a service that needs to be covered by the government. End of story. Will the member of the Conservative Party Question. stand up for women's right and vote in favour of that motion. Members will please take their seats. Minister of Health. Absolutely, we will and we do. You know, the member opposite uh, should know that we made a very recent announcement last month that will allow and expand mammogram uh, for individuals who are, want to self-referral from 40 and up. Um, those are the types of concrete examples of what we are doing. You know, a non-binding resolution isn't going to improve women's health in the province of Ontario. Actual concrete action is what we are doing, whether it's with OHIP Plus, with the Trillium Drug Plan, with expanding uh, access, self-referrals for mammograms. We're getting the job done. Thank you. Thank you. The next question, the member for Peterborough, Kawartha. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And first off, I want to say happy Scottish Heritage Day to everyone today. Hey. My question is for the Minister of Transportation. The people of my riding are telling me that the carbon tax is making life more expensive for them as the cost of everything keeps increasing. The rising cost of fuel is greatly impacting individuals and families in every corner of our province. I want to point out that when Sayers grocery store burnt in Apsley. It was the only grocery store within 50 kilometres. People had to drive to get groceries, and the carbon tax increased the cost of gas, which hurt everyone. Ontarians should not be experiencing financial hardship or having to make difficult choices on whether they can afford to drive to the places they need to go to, like the grocery store. It's unacceptable that the federal government is intent Question. on raising the carbon tax even more at a time when Ontarians are struggling. Speaker, can the minister please explain what the impact of the federal carbon tax is having on transportation needs to Ontario families? Good question. Minister of Transportation. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to that member uh, for that question. Uh, the federal carbon tax is hurting Ontario's economy and is really hurting uh, families and making life harder. Speaker, the federal government doesn't seem to understand that for parents filling up their cars in places like Peterborough and Kenora and Wawa, there are, in many cases, no alternatives. And the carbon tax adds unnecessary costs for families who need to rely on a car to drive their kids to school, to go to work, or to visit their doctor. Unlike in Toronto, communities like Kenora, Peterborough, Wawa, don't have access to rapid transit and subways, and we need to recognize this. And Speaker, it's clear that the federal Liberals and our provincial and their provincial counterparts are out of touch with the needs of Ontario's uh, families. And we urge the federal government to do the right thing, support Ontario's families, and scrap your carbon tax. 
supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for that response. The Minister is correct. The federal Liberals are out of touch when it comes to understanding that the carbon tax is leading to soaring fuel prices that make life unaffordable and difficult for everyone. And anyone sitting in this chamber that agrees that the carbon tax is good for the people of Ontario is out of touch. Exactly. The reality is that Ontarians are already struggling with the high cost of goods, groceries and gas because of that carbon tax. The carbon tax adversely affects every business and negatively impacts our economy and every single worker in Ontario. That's why our government must continue to call on the federal government to do the right thing and eliminate the tax completely. Here, here. Speaker, can the minister please elaborate on how future carbon tax increases are going to negatively impact the people of Ontario? The Minister of Transportation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. At a time when Canadians are seeing costs go up everywhere, the federal Liberals, supported by their provincial counterparts, are raising taxes on families across the province. Speaker, the federal Liberals will increase uh, from $65 per tonne to $170 per tonne by 2030. If we think gas is expensive now, it's going to get a lot worse. It's going to get harder for families to take their kids to soccer practice. It's going to get even more expenses uh, for us to afford food. It's about time that the federal Liberals and the provincial Liberals stand up for drivers and appreciate the unique needs of those in communities that don't have rapid transit and Response. subways. Families cannot afford higher taxes. We have to be serious about reducing emissions and addressing affordability, and they need to take leadership and scrap the carbon tax. Thank you. The next question, the member for Ottawa Centre. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Nice to see him here this morning. Unfortunately, I hasten to inform the members of this House, Speaker. Stop the clock. Stop the clock. Stop the clock. It is against the rules of the House to make reference to the absence of a member. And it creates disorder in the House. I would remind members not to make reference to the absence of any member. Order. Restart the clock. Member for Ottawa Center. Thank you, Speaker. I, I hastily and sadly inform the members of this House that Order. in a question to the Premier, Metrolinx has missed another deadline. We were supposed to hear two months ago, according to their failed CEO, Mr. Verster, that we get an update on the Edmonton Crosstown project, but two months has passed, and the only thing that has happened is that Mr. Verster has apparently earned another $160,000, thanks to the Ontario taxpayer, wow. and his army of 59 vice presidents and 19 C-suite executives are probably doing very well. So my question to the Premier through you, Speaker, can we expect an actual update from Mr. Verster? on the status of the Eglinton Crosstown LRT. To reply, the Minister of Transportation. We are launching the largest public transit uh, expansion in the history of this province and this country, and in fact, in North America, $70 billion over the next 10 years. And that includes, Mr. Speaker, historic projects like the Ontario Line, which that member uh, voted against and their party voted against the Scarborough subway extension, a project, Mr. Speaker, that the provincial Liberals spoke about for 15 years, did absolutely nothing, ignored the people of Scarborough and under this uh, Premier and his leadership. We're building the Scarborough subway extension, Mr. Speaker. We look at uh, LRTs across this province, the Hazel McCallion line. We were just there with the Premier, the hardworking uh, uh, our construction workers on the line, making sure it's ready to go. Mr. Speaker, we're going to change the face of transportation across this province. We're going to change how people are moving. We're going to build highways. We're going to build public transit. Response. And we'll take no lessons from the official opposition on that. Supplementary question. Speaker, I do know, back to the Premier, I hope, that this government is building something. It's not transit. They're building the bank accounts of consultants and executives that serve Mr. Burst. Right? That's what they're doing. 
This government seems to be confused, Speaker, rather like the federal government. They have great ideas about aspirational transit, transit that might come one day, transit that is a billion dollars over budget in this particular project and three years late. So my question to the Premier, why are you continuing to tolerate an executive who apparently earns a million dollars a year thanks to the Ontario taxpayer, who presides over failing transit projects, who has spent at least $500 million in court fighting the company building this project, and why are you not respecting the women and men all across Ontario that operate our transit system and paying them the salaries they deserve and giving the municipalities the money they deserve? Operational transit. That's what we might do. Members will take their seats. Remind the members to make their comments to the chair. The Premier to reply. Mr. Speaker, through the carbon tax king that wants to increase taxes on absolutely everyone, absolutely everyone, I'll follow up what the minister has just said. We're building the largest transit expansion in North America. We're doubling the size of the Toronto transit system, as he was mentioning, for years and years, under decades, under the Liberals. They forgot about the people of Scarborough. They forgot about the people of Etobicoke going west, which is, by the way, is six weeks ahead of schedule and on time. And, and we're doing the Young Extension as, as well. And he mentioned all the LRTs going in, the great Hazel McCallion line out in Mississauga, the line going along Finch. We're making a difference here for the people in Toronto and the GTA and right across this province. We're going to continue building transit. As you vote no against every single transit Spots. project, we're going to keep moving forward. Thank you for the question. Question, the member for Ottawa South. Questions for the Premier. Four years ago last week, we passed Bill 141, which is a defibrillator a registration and public access act. Second reading. Now, this bill lets us know where defibrillators are across the province. It also lets us know that they've been maintained, so we know they work. There were three bills, actually the member from Nickel Belt, myself, the member from Agents and Lawrence. And we asked the House, new House leader at the time to say, pass this bill, take it to committee, let's travel it. We did that. It received royal assent in June 2020. We were all pretty excited. Change. We did something good. We're going to save lives. Since then, crickets. The bill's not enacted. It hasn't been enacted three and a half years later. A bill that will, that will help people keep people alive. So could the minister, Question. the premier, please tell us exactly what's happened with this bill? And to apply the deputy premier and minister of health. Um, respectfully, the member opposite is uh, not quite up to date. We have absolutely been working with our paramedic partners and other municipal leaders to make sure that we get this right. But you know, I'm going to give credit where credit is due, and that is my amazing parliamentary yes. assistant, the yeah. member from Eglinton Lawrence, who brought this bill forward. Now, we, we often talk about how our government has a plan and it's working. This is a beautiful example of something that the member from Eglinton Lawrence saw, um, brought forward a solution, and now we're working through those regulatory details to make sure we get it right. And I'm incredibly proud of the work that she's been doing. Yeah. Supplementary question. Respectfully, uh, Speaker, three and a half years. Three and a half years. So defibrillators save lives. The person sitting next to me is living proof. And if they couldn't find the defibrillator or it didn't work, that chair would be empty right now. Right? So 7,000 people have cardiac arrest in Ontario every year. 7,000 people. And we know that if defibrillation is applied within three minutes, most of them survive. Every minute after, gets worse. Three minutes, three and a half years. Three minutes, three and a half years. Minister, will you commit? Will you commit to making sure that this bill is enacted before we return here in February? It's important to Ontario families because they don't want any empty chairs. Mr. Health. You know, I respect the member opposite. 
I really do. I think he's been doing an excellent job as the interim leader. Um, you will, of course, transition to a new role. But I, I want to give a bit of a history lesson. You know, you had a Liberal member when the Liberal government was here in control in the province of Ontario who brought forward very similar legislation. That was Ted McMeekin. What did your government do with it? What they did with it, Speaker, is they ignored it. We're actually passing this legislation, we're passing the regulations, and we're putting it in place while you had members in your own party that you turned your back on and said, we're not interested in that registry. We are doing it. Thank you, Speaker. Again, I'll remind members to make their comments through the chair, not directly across the floor of the House. The next question, the member for Whitby. Thank you, uh, Speaker. My question is for the Associate Minister of Small Business. The federal Liberal government has already raised the carbon tax on gasoline five times, and they intend to raise prices another seven times in the coming years. The carbon tax adversely affects our businesses and negatively impacts our economy and, Speaker, Ontario workers. That is why it was truly shocking to hear that the Liberal member for Canada Carleton actually stood up in the legislature and praised the carbon tax as beneficial for Ontarians. While the opposition NDP and independent Liberals continue to believe that increasing taxes is the best solution, our government realizes that's wrong Question. and unfair to hardworking Ontarians. Speaker, can the Associate Minister please explain the negative impact of the carbon tax on the province's businesses? Thank you. The Associate Minister for Small Business. Thank you, Speaker, and I really do appreciate the member from Whitby for raising such an important question. Speaker, the continuous increase in the carbon tax poses significant challenges for these businesses and the broader economy. Fuel is a significant expense for the trucking and logistics industry, and the continuous rise in the carbon tax directly translates into higher fuel prices. These higher costs have a cascading effect as they are passed on to small businesses through increased transportation costs for goods. This means less money to expand their operations or, even worse, potentially laying off staff. With the, fall, with the recent fall federal economic statement, Ottawa has made it very clear it's only up from here for the carbon tax. Speaker, I know the Liberals are busy deciding who gets to drive the minivan next, but if they have some time, they should pick up the phone and do their but. jobs by telling the federal counterparts to scrap the tax. Supplementary question. Well, thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Associate Minister for that response. According to the Parliamentary Budget Officer, by 2030, Ontario households will experience a decline in their quality of life due to the additional costs resulting from the carbon tax. A financial loss of $2,000 per household will bring even further hardship to individuals and families who are already struggling to make ends meet. Speaker, increasing the carbon tax will negatively impact the people of Ontario and, yes, our economy. Contrary to claims made by the Liberal Party, the carbon tax adversely affects our businesses and negatively impacts our economy and Ontario workers. Speaker, can the Associate Minister please elaborate on the impact of the carbon tax on small businesses and communities across our province? The Associate Minister of Small Business. Thank you, Speaker, and again to the member from Whitby for the question. Speaker, let me tell you what I've heard from members of the Canadian Federation of Independent Business. And from a small manufacturer, I quote, the carbon tax increasing each year is crippling our ability to do business outside of our local area. We used to have a large province-wide presence with some of our product in major retailer and online delivery, but now shipping costs are too high to make a profit doing that. We've had to pivot our whole business model because of that. And from a construction business, and I quote, the carbon tax is simply an added cost to our small business. We need trucks to move our equipment and fuel costs are through the roof. I feel there are better ways to help fight climate change. Speaker, the opposition have 
failed to recognize the impacts this tax has on Ontario small businesses and the communities that rely on them. Uh, it is high time for the NDP and the Liberals to stop grandstanding. Tell Ottawa, scrap the tax! Order. The next question, the member for Thunder Bay, Superior North. Speaker, to the Premier, seniors in my riding of Thunder Bay, Superior North, and the neighbouring riding of Thunder Bay, Atacokan, are telling me they cannot afford to pay for the RSV, RSV vaccine that the government is only providing under OHIP to seniors in long-term care. People over the age of 60 account for 80 per cent of deaths from the virus, yet the ministry has erected financial barriers to adults seeking the vaccine who live in their own homes. Will the Premier end this discriminatory practice and provide full RSV coverage for all people over the age of 60? Mr. Bell. Thank you, Speaker. Well, I'm, I'm very pleased that you have constituents in your communities who are so excited about a vaccine that is literally, uh, for the first time ever, available for RSV. Um, as, uh, as soon as Health Canada approved that vaccine, uh, Ontario was and continues to be the only Canadian jurisdiction that is providing RSV vaccines for free in our long-term care homes and our high-risk retirement homes. It is a very strategic decision to make sure that the individuals who are most vulnerable living in those congregate care settings have access to what truly is a life-saving, game-changing vaccine. Thank you. That's a question. Access to the Shingrix vaccine is also a problem. For seniors between the ages of 65 and 70, the vaccine is covered by OHIP, but anybody older than 70 has to pay $300 to get the vaccine, even though the risks of getting a severe case increase with age. My mother, who turns 96 today, <laughs> she was not offered the vaccine and came down with an excruciating case of shingles a year ago and is still experiencing pain to this day. Will the Premier stop this discriminatory practice, remove the upper age limit, and provide shingles coverage for all people over the age of 65? Thank you and happy birthday to your mother. Um, I want to say, you know, Ontario does lead Canada in terms of the number of drugs and access to vaccines that we have on the formulary. Uh, again, we are very strategic in making sure that we have and ensure access to the people who are most vulnerable. You know, when I think of the changes that we've been able to make because we have COVID-19 vaccines in our community, because we have thousands of pharmacies and pharmacists who are on a daily basis providing vaccines to our residents, it really is taking a very different approach and making sure that we are uh, protecting as many Ontario residents as, as possible. We'll continue to do that work because we see that this is yet another protection to ensure people in Ontario remain Response. safe. Thank you. Thank you. The next question, the member for Don Valley North. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Attorney General. Speaker, my constituents, both landlords and tenants, often express their frustration with the delay at the Landlords and Tenants Board. Speaker, we currently have the national housing crisis. The long-term rental supply plays a vital role in tackling this issue. Sadly, we are seeing financial, financial disaster caused by land-paying tenants would result in landlords have to either sell their property or move into short-term rentals. Speaker, the LTP is the backbone of a functional rental community and provides a legal framework of how landlords and tenants should govern themselves. It is intended as a means of resolving disputes between both parties in a fair and timely manner. Speaker, 
My question is, what step is the government taking to ensure question. that LTP is fair and fast for everyone? Thank you. The Attorney General. Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member from Don Valley North. He's clearly in touch with his constituents because we're hearing it from our constituents as well, Mr. Speaker. The Landlord Tenant Board is an important part of our system, and I can tell you we're making progress because this government made investments last year that the NDP opposed. They made investments this year that the NDP opposed. We have doubled the number of adjudicators, Mr. Speaker. By the end of today, there will be 69 where there were 40 in June, Mr. Speaker, full time. We're adding more. We'll be at 86 uh, very shortly. Now, Mr. Mr. Speaker, I sat down with uh, Sean Weir, the executive chair, and we are making progress. Of our 13 tribunals, 11 are hitting their targets, and Landlord Tenant Board is next, Mr. Speaker. Of urgent matters reviewed and processed September of last year, 964. September this year, 2,356, Mr. Speaker, 140 percent improvement. Mr. Speaker, in terms of scheduled hearings in last year, 49,000 scheduled hearings. This year so far, 70,000. 40 percent increase, Mr. Speaker. I'll have more than supplementary. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. And thank you for Attorney General for his response. Speaker, since the pandemic, the issues of fraudulent rental applications and non-payment of rental rent have surged to historical high level. Fake identities, job letters, employment income, bank statements and forced credit reports have become more common in rental applications without the offenders facing any consequences. Speaker, those acts are not just hurting landlords. The impact of their behavior extends to honest paying tenants as well. When landlords start to withdraw from long-term rentals, it limits their choice of housing and increases the cost of living. Speaker, can the Attorney General tell us what can be done to make sure those who break the law intentionally Question. are held accountable to help restore public confidence in our justice system? Thank you. The Attorney General. Speaker, and again, thank you to the member from Don Valley North. We, when we looked at the system and, and how it had developed through COVID, we have frozen fees, Mr. Speaker. We have added resources. We have changed systems. We have put a whole new backbone into it, Mr. Speaker. We want to make sure that the landlords, and when we say landlords, we're talking about not just large landlords, we're talking about your neighbours who are trying to rent out part of their house or, or, or an investment property that they have, Mr. Speaker. So we looked at where the choke points were in the system, and one of them was the orders. Uh, once the hearing had happened, the orders weren't getting out fast enough. The L3s and L4s, Mr. Speaker, uh, in February of this year, there were a thousand waiting to be processed. As of early October of this year, there were 75, Mr. Speaker. We are taking progress, and we will get there, and we will make sure that the landlords and the tenants have a fair and responsive system. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Okay, the next question, the member for Thornhill. My question is for the Minister of Finance. You know, when meeting with local businesses in my riding of Thornhill, they consistently tell me about how the federal carbon tax is so detrimental to our local economy and making their businesses more expensive to operate. Speaker, our government is very clear that local businesses are essential and serve a vital role in driving our province's economic prosperity. Local businesses in all communities need to feel supported, not penalized. It's not fair or right that our businesses are being punished because of this regressive tax forced on them by the federal Liberal government. Speaker, can the minister please explain how a carbon tax negatively impacts our local businesses? The parliamentary assistant and member for Oakville. Thank you, Speaker, and uh, thank you to the hardworking member from Thornhill. They are absolutely right. <coughs> Local businesses are a pivotal part of our economy, and this government continues to ensure they are getting the supports that they need. That's why during COVID, we took action early and provided grants to small businesses to ensure that they would come out of COVID and continue to thrive across this province. But, Speaker, Local business owners in the members' riding are also right when they say the carbon tax is driving costs and making life more expensive for the people of Ontario. It's not just driving up the price of gasoline, Speaker, but it's also driving up the expenses of supply chains, our housing, grocery prices, and of course, inflation. It's not fair for the people of this province, and that's why we continue to fight the carbon tax and call on the federal government to end this regressive tax. 
Will the opposition join us on our call or continue to sit on their hands? Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. The supplementary question, back to the member for Thorne. Speaker, and thank you to the member from Oakville for his dedicated work. Um, you know, when it comes to the negative impact of the carbon tax, everyone shares the same message of concern. From the governor of the Bank of Canada to the parliamentary budget officers, academics, economists, business leaders, and even premiers of all political stripes agree that the carbon tax is making life more challenging and unaffordable for everyone. The carbon tax is also increasing prices and is creating unfavorable conditions that weaken our competitive economic advantage. Local businesses are struggling, and this regressive tax is only making their work more difficult. During this time of economic uncertainty and affordability concerns, Ontarians should not be taxed more. Speaker, can the parliamentary assistant please explain how our government is supporting Ontarian businesses and families? Parliamentary Assistant to Minister of Finance. Thank you again, Speaker, and thank you again to, uh, for the question from, uh, to the, from the member from Thornhill. And as the member clearly outlined, the carbon tax continues to drive up prices and make life more unaffordable. And I was disappointed to see here in our chamber the Liberal Party of this province show their continued support by voting against our motion on the removal of carbon tax on all home heating fuels. They did this in spite of the evidence, highlighting the damage it's doing to local businesses throughout Ontario. But that's why, Speaker, while our party continues to vote to increase prices for Ontarians, we are working to make life more affordable. From removing double transit fares, ending tolls on Highway 412 and 418, to eliminating the need for license stickers, we are continuing to take action and put money back in the pockets of the people of Ontario at a time when they need it the most. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. The next question, the member for Toronto St. Paul. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, 62 women and children were lost to femicide in the past year, according to Awake's 2023 femicide list. We know these numbers, with each passing day arising. Yesterday, I met with Awake and spoke with workers, women, on the front lines of gender based violence and intimate partner violence, working hard to help save the lives of women and children exposed to violence. You refuse to listen to our countless calls for you to name gender-based violence as, as an epidemic in this province of Ontario. This sector hasn't seen real investments, deep investments, to its operational funding in 15 years and counting. My question is to the Premier. You keep talking about a national plan to address gender-based violence, national dollars. As Premier of Ontario, what is your plan? What is Ontario's provincial plan to address gender-based and intimate partner violence? Let's not pass the buck. Thank you, Speaker. Members will take their seats. Member for Stormont, Dundas, South Glengarry, and Parliamentary System. Our government will always be there to protect women and their children escaping violence. We back that up. We back that work up with investments. Supports to victims of violence has increased by 6.5 million in this year's budget over last year. And we have flowed $6 million to support initiatives and supports in rural and remote communities. We invested $18.5 million over three years to enhance the transitional and housing support program to help victims of domestic violence and survivors of human trafficking find and maintain housing and help transition to independence. And those are on top of approximately $240 million we invested for victims of violence and $10.2 million for violence prevention initiatives. Just two weeks ago, we no negotiated with the federal government to implement the National Action Plan to End Gender-Based Violence that will see an additional $162 million invested over four years in Ontario. Speaker, our government has and will continue increasing investments Bonds. across the board to end violence against women, and we are going to keep doing whatever it takes to protect women. The supplementary question. Premier, shelters and transition houses are bursting at the seams, Speaker. Many children and women have nowhere to go. The sector is facing critical staffing shortages and turnover as wages in this sector have been brutally shut down and stifled because of this Conservative government's Bill 124. While they should be expanding programs to meet, and de to meet the demand, they're struggling to keep their doors open on shoestring budgets that are not tending to their operational needs. Yesterday, a frontline worker shared how they're fundraising for food for their clients. Another spoke how their organization's funding expired, reversed 
reversing progress made for women and children fleeing violence. Again, my question is back to the Premier. Will he commit to ending gender-based violence today by creating a sustainable needs-based funding model for this sector? Will he support these workers and can Bill 124? Thank you. And again, to apply, the member for Stormont Dundas, South Glengarry. Speaker, it's crucial that women and children fleeing violence have the supports they need to start new lives. That's why we're working to increase access to safe and affordable housing for women ex escaping violence and human trafficking. Order. We're investing $18.5 million over three Order. years in the Transitional Housing Support Program to support victims of domestic violence and survivors of human trafficking find and maintain Order. housing to help transition to independence. It also connects them to socially and culturally responsive wraparound community supports like safety planning, counselling, health and wellness, education, Order. legal and immigration services, financial resources and childcare services. Speaker, every single Ontarian deserves to have a safe place to live, especially women fleeing violence and their children, and our government will ensure that they have the support that they need. Okay, the next question. The member for London Fanshawe. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Families, uh, families and advocates from across the province are taking action today to call for an end to the severe shortage of licensed childcare spaces. Thousands of families are stuck on wait lists. Centres are raising concerns about the ballooning cost of operating an underfunding system. A shortage of workers threatens the program. And while federal funding has increased, provincial, ch provincial child care funding has decreased in 2018. Speaker, during an affordability crisis, why is this government underfunding the child care system and delaying the implementation of affordable child care across this province? The Minister of Education can reply. Speaker, let us not forget that the NDP and Liberals urged Ontario to sign the first deal with the federal government that would have admitted every single for-profit child care family and operator. They would have denied flexibility. They would have left $3 billion on the table, and they would have had no review mechanism with the federal government to get more funding as the member opposite urges us to deliver for the sector. You can't have it both ways. You propped up the Liberal Party that increased child care fees by over 500 per cent, and here we are, a progressive Conservative government under our Premier's leadership that cut fees by 50 percent, building 86,000 more spaces, and the NDP voted against that progress for families and for working people. We will continue to build spaces. We'll continue to cut fees. We will do so without the support of the NDP. And that's regretful because families in this province would believe, want to believe, we can come together to provide affordability for the people we represent. Nice. Supplementary question. Mr. Speaker, I don't think children should be used as a political um, football. So, speakers, speaker, experts are saying that the majority of Ontario's early childhood educators and child care staff don't qualify for the government's recent announced wage supports. We have workers here today who say they can't afford to make a living working in child care. The YMCA of Greater Toronto has just 16,000 kids enrolled in its 35,000 licensed spaces because they don't have enough people to staff the spaces. Will the minister commit to a salary scale starting at $25 per hour for yeah. all childcare workers and $30 per hour for registered ECEs today? Yes or no? Members, please take their seats. The Minister of Education. Yes, we will continue to raise fees for our workers, notwithstanding the opposition of the NDP. You voted against a 19 per cent increase for workers starting this January. You're voting against a $1 increase every hour per year thereafter. That's on you. On this government, we're increasing fees, career laddering opportunities, professional development. We're launching an ad program. And in the words of the CEO of the College of Early Childhood Educators, and I quote, we are encouraged that the strategy seeks to address some of the long-standing systemic challenges that contribute to attrition in the profession and the current workforce crisis in childcare. End quote. Mr. Speaker, we're going to keep increasing fees, or increasing spaces, decreasing fees, support the workers, increase their wages every single year, and do better to support all families and the people in the province of Ontario. Thank you. 
The next question, the member for Brantford Brant. Oh, thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Energy. An increasing number of constituents from my riding have voiced their concerns about the carbon tax and its harmful impact on their lives. Speaker, we are already in a cost of living crisis here in Ontario, and people are especially fearful about how the carbon tax will make things more expensive. Most Ontarians are already feeling the negative impact that the carbon tax is having on their lives, and sadly, the federal government does not care. The carbon tax adversely affects our businesses and negatively impacts our economy and Ontario workers. Speaker, can the minister please explain how further increases to the carbon tax will hurt Ontarians? Thank you. Member for Glengarry Prescott Russell and Parliamentary Assistant. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member of Brantford Brant for the excellent question. It's a topic that needs to be addressed for sure. Uh, I do not want to be the bearer of bad news, but if the carbon tax persists, the parliamentary budget officer has confirmed that by 2030, the tax will cost families $2,000 a year. And that is after the federal government's climate initiative program, incentive program, I mean. Speaker, it's important for the federal liberals to understand that our government has shown time again through, the, through our programs that we do, do not need the carbon tax to cut emissions. Yeah. We are currently looking at the expansion of the CHHI uh, program, the uh, Clean Home uh, Eating Initiative, and uh, to, to uh, cut the eating emissions by a third. And Ontario already has one of the cleanest energy grid in the world, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. Speaker, it makes no sense for the federal government to keep increasing this tax on the backs of families. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member for Glengarry Prescott Russell for the response. The carbon tax adversely affects our businesses and negatively impacts our economy and Ontario workers. For people living in rural, remote, and northern Ontario communities, the negative impacts of the carbon tax are truly devastating. For many individuals, the carbon tax is creating additional hardships and challenges for all sectors of the economy. The carbon tax harms hardworking individuals, businesses, and farmers by taking away money from them. The delivery of every single consumer good in our province, particularly fresh and processed food, is being affected by one of the most economically harmful taxes. Speaker, can the parliamentary assistant please elaborate on how the carbon tax negatively impacts all Ontarians? Thank you. The member for Glengarry Prescott Russell. Speaker, I couldn't agree more. Speaker, my constituent have told me how this tax have made their life worse, but that they have to endure this as fuel is too integral a part of their lives for them to find another option. Manufacturer pass the increased cost of distribution to food depots, who then pass it on to supermarket, who makes the consumer absorb the tax by increasing prices. That's why everyone should care about eliminating the carbon tax. The increased fuel costs for a farmer in my riding in Glengarry Prescott Russell, Prescott Russell makes the food they deliver to a Toronto supermarket more expensive, which in turn affects the buyer. Speaker, in this case, one person affected by the carbon tax is felt by another person who lives across the province from them. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes our question period for this morning. We have a deferred vote on private members' notice of motion number 36. Call in the members. This is a five-minute bell.